Hello and good evening to you all as we continue our journey through the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm doing this written study of it and we are currently, I am currently on the last of the seven letters to the seven churches. I always do videos as I am preparing to write so that I can get my thoughts out, record them here, and then obviously get feedback. Laodicea is one of the touchy subjects. I will just say that because there are so many people who think there's a, such a thing as a lukewarm Christian. And I will preface this video out just like I did in the title saying there is no such thing as a lukewarm Christian. Hi, John. Welcome. Nice to see you. So the way that I titled this video is introducing three cities, actually, Hierapolis, Colossae, and Laodicea. In order to understand the references that Jesus is making regarding the whole lukewarm conversation, you literally have to understand the geography and the history of the actual physical city of Laodicea. Now, keep in mind that John is writing this, Jesus's words, to this church that actually existed in 95 AD. So he's going to use a method of teaching that they would understand. What better than to incorporate the actual conditions of the city itself? Because we are thousands of years removed from this, we don't readily understand what they would have understood in that time. If you have caught the last video that I did regarding the behold, I stand at the door and knock, you will understand already that this is an entirely unsaved church. I won't uh, go through everything I talked about. There are two videos about the behold, I stand at the door and knock. And the second one was like a visual representation of a door and an open door and how that relates to two of the seven letters uh, to the seven churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea, because you're talking about macro and micro. Philadelphia is macro, large scale. It's when you believe in Christ, he set before you an open door. And that is all about the kingdom all about permanent citizenship in the kingdom through the open door, the door being Christ. So that's talking about essentially eternal security on a large scale, is that once you've believed in Jesus, he set before you an open door that no man can shut, and that door is into the kingdom where you immediately get permanent citizenship in the kingdom of God. This is talking, this letter to the church of the Laodiceans is talking about that same concept on a small scale. The individual, not just the corporate body of Christ going into the kingdom, because, you know, that's in that verse too. Uh, because I always kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world to try them and dwell upon the earth. That is a corporate event, which is known as the rapture of the church. So this is talking about large scale believers as a whole. Laodicea is the individual part of that. He is coming to the individual home. Behold, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You have to invite him in. Once that door is opened, because if he's standing at the door and knocking, that means you're standing behind a closed door. When you're talking about the closed door, open door conversation, you're talking about the gospel. Open door means entrance into the kingdom, which necessarily means that the closed door means you haven't been granted entrance into the kingdom yet. So on the small individual scale, if he's standing behind a closed door knocking, asking for you to let him in, what does that mean? That means the Laodiceans are not saved. They have to open the door, let him in, go through the door, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And then as a uh, part of, they, they join the corporate, the whole body of Christ, which is granted entry into the kingdom through the open door, Philadelphia. So you have a very similar kind of situation in both. One has already accepted Christ, Philadelphia, and the large scale, and Laodicea is the individual scale, which is why he's writing to the church of the Laodiceans. This is the only church where he's writing to individuals, not to the corporate church as a whole not to the church in Ephesus, not to the church in Smyrna, cities, whole cities. 
he's writing to the church of the Laodiceans because they are not part of a corporate entity. They all have a similar belief system, which is why they are, he's writing to them as a whole, but he's writing to the individuals because salvation is an individual choice. They each have to open the door and let him in. So that was two videos prior to this that I went through that conversation that is specifically talking about the new covenant as it relates to the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony. There's about seven or eight steps to that. The first one is the ketubah, where the bridegroom goes to the home of the intended bride to offer the marriage covenant. They invite him in and discuss the terms. And if they agree to the terms, they will sup bread and wine. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open unto me, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. That is literally what that is talking about. It is two unbelievers. Jesus is coming to offer a new covenant relationship, and all they need to do is believe and accept the terms of the covenant, which synonymous with the Last Supper are the bread and the wine, tokens of the new covenant, acceptance of the new covenant, where you get the spirit and you're invited into the kingdom to uh, have permanent citizenship. So that's what the last video was about, the whole behold, I stand at the door and not. So now we get into this conversation about the lukewarm. What does this mean? Well, like I said, this letter was written in 95 AD. There was a historical and a geographic interpretation behind that. We make it so difficult because we are removed from the historicity of this. We don't readily understand this unless we open a book and study or, hey, go to the Internet and look it up. There's three cities in view. It was like a tri-city area. Hierapolis. Colossae, and Laodicea. Laodicea, as we know from the text of this letter, was an earthly rich city. What they lacked was water sources. So you have two cities in this tri-city area who shared said resources with the city of Laodicea. Hierapolis, known for its hot springs, and Colossae, known for its cold springs. So wouldn't you know, this city who doesn't have its natural water sources has to pipe in water from these other two cities, hot water and cold water. This is the history and geography of this letter. Under the angel of the church of the individuals who don't know me, Laodiceans. Right. These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Can work save people? No, they cannot. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Okay, so let's take a modern twist on this and think around your household. Think around your doctor's office. Think around a hospital. Think around the modern take on the hot and the cold. So I'm sitting in my kitchen, right? And my dishes were going earlier. Would I wash my dishes with lukewarm water? I would not. Why would I not? Because they wouldn't be clean. What does hot water do? It cleans and it, sta it sterilizes. Would you, when you go to a hospital, want your doctor to perform surgery on you with, with tools that he cleaned with lukewarm water? You would not, probably. Think about cold, my refrigerator sitting next to me. How effective would that be if it, the freezer didn't keep things frozen or if the refrigerator didn't keep things cold? Everything would spoil. So what you're talking about is original states. The original intent of the hot water piped in from said city, Hierapolis, it was intended to be hot so that it could be used for its said purpose, to keep people clean, to keep them from getting sick. When you drink lukewarm water that's made a journey through dirty pipes, do you think you're going to not get sick? You probably will. Would you bathe in lukewarm water and expect to be clean? Probably not. Would you be able to cook effectively with cold water that wasn't hot or lukewarm water? You know, these things. The original intent 
does it serve its purpose if it is not that? And and this is not a gray area. This is where we, I think, get off track with this, is that we have a tendency to accept much gray area where there should be black and white. Oh, but maybe you could kind of use it. No, it is or it isn't. You aren't a little bit saved. You either are saved or you are not saved. You're either bound for the kingdom or you're not bound for the kingdom. The water is either hot and useful or it's not hot and it is useless. This is what we need to, to look at this as, is there is an intended goal here. Is that goal achieved? No. So it falls short. Salvation isn't only a kind of, sort of, maybe. It is an is or it an is not. Was the water from Hierapolis hot when it reached to Laodicea? No, it was not. Was the water from Colossae cold when it reached Laodicea? No, it was not. And so both of those things were useless. It is black and white. I know thy works, which cannot save you. It either is saved or it is not saved. Can your work save you? No, which means it is not saved. I would thou wert hot or cold. Saved, useful for the purpose intended. Again, black and white. Is it yes or is it not? No. It is not hot. It is not cold. It is a no. I would thou wert hot or cold so that I could use you for the intended purpose that I need you for, but because you're not saved, I can't. So then because you are not useful for the purpose, because you're not saved, you're not my child, you are not part of the body that is fitly joined together. This is another point of contention, which the Bible makes very, very simple. And we're not even going to get into that Christian in name only. No, you are a follower of Christ being in Christ or you are not. We're not getting into that stupid gray area of Christian in name only. A Christian is a follower of Christ. You either are or you are not. We're not doing gray here. We are doing black and white. As a Christian, a follower of Christ, someone who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved, what does he say about you? Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, as followers of Christ, you comprise the body of Christ. He is the head. What does he call the body of Christ, who is comprised of believers in Jesus Christ, therefore appropriately named Christians, fitly joined together? And compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working of the measure of every part makes the increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so let's go to another passage. 1 Corinthians 12. What does it talk about the members of the body of Christ? We'll start in verse six. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. This is the body of Christ who possesses the spirit of God, who is useful in one way or another is useful. It is as it is intended. It is hot if it is meant to be hot. It is cold if it is meant to be cold. All these work at that one and the self-same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. Or as the body is one fitly joined together hath many members, 
And all the members of that one body being many are one body. And so is Christ. Christians, believers in Christ, fitly joined together. Does that in any way, shape, or form mesh with the next words? Because you are not useful to me, because you are not in me, and you don't have my spirit, and I can't use you, I will spew you out of my mouth. That in no way, shape, or form should indicate to anyone that that is a member of a fitly joined together body. God doesn't spew body parts out of his mouth. What he does is spew people who are worthless. He's going to judge them. They aren't going into his kingdom. They are not going into his kingdom, at least not in that unsafe state. Which is why, later in the letter, he is counseling them to believe on him. He's saying, yeah, I'm standing at the door knocking. All you have to do is open it unto me and invite me in. But you have to open it and invite me in, which they have not yet done. So what we learn from this is that it is a black and white scenario. You are what you need to be. Uh, in order to be used by God and fit for his kingdom as part of the fitly joined together body of Christ. And if you are not part of the fitly joined together body of Christ, you are not useful. He cannot. It's not that you aren't. It's that he can't use you because you don't have a spirit. You're not going to bear good fruit. Kind of like what he said in Matthew 7 and in James. Can a good, good tree bear bad fruit? No. Can a bad tree bear good fruit? No. It's the Matthew 6, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal, but where, uh, lay up, yeah. But these people are laying up for themselves treasures on earth, which is what the next part of this letter says. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That is earthly wealth. This church is the very opposite of Smyrna, who was earthly destitute, but heavenly rich. We learn that from Revelation 2, 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. They are earthly destitute, but they are heavenly rich. Contrasting with Laodicea, they are earthly rich and heavenly destitute. They have no heavenly treasures. They couldn't be because they're not presently heaven bound. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I don't need God. I can do it on my own. See, I'm doing just fine. Remember, he told the rich young ruler that it is uh, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Not impossible, which is why he he uh, follows that up with, but with God, all things are possible. Not impossible, but hard. Because a person who can do it all on their own isn't going to be looking for help elsewhere. Money can buy a lot of people a lot of things. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And they don't know that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Again, the opposite of Smyrna, who was earthly, poor, poverty, but rich, heavenly. These people are poor, heavenly, wretched, miserable, poor, blind. Because what lifts blindness? What is the opposite of a blindness? Being able to see. That's a spiritual connotation. They're blind because they don't have the spirit in them to illuminate, to give them knowledge, to give them wisdom, which are attributes of the spirit and naked. What is... Oh, all the way back in the garden. <laughs> like, how do I want to explain this? There's another reference in Revelation 16 about this. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest, they walk lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Naked. 
Adam and Eve, the first thing that happened when they ate the fruit, when they sinned, is they knew they were naked. Naked is a consequence of having sin and shame uncovered. The covering for sin and shame is love. Love covers a multitude of sins. All the way back in the garden, I talked about this too. God, marriage covenant with Adam. Marriage covenants, we learn about in Ephesians 5 in the New Covenant, helps us understand uh, the New Covenant in the Old Testament, the one between God and Adam, and then the New Testament, the one between Christ and the church. New Covenant, marriage covenant, ancient Jewish wedding ceremony, Christ and the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Went through this in the first video, so if you did not catch that, briefly recap. But the steps of the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony as it relates to Christ and the church is from fall back up to perfection. In the garden, it was between God and the first Adam, Jesus being called the second Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. God and the first Adam was from perfection to the fall. Husband and wife, God, in the marriage covenant with Adam has the duty to perfectly love Adam. Adam, as the wife in the marriage covenant, has the duty to obey or to submit to God. Thus, God gave him one command that Adam had to obey. Adam failed in that. But God did not fail in his perfect love. And as a result, he covered the shame of their nakedness, which was a consequence of knowing good from evil through the experience of evil. Love covers a multitude of sins. God's love as the husband in the marriage covenant provided the first sacrifice to adequately clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. This is why in the second Adam marriage covenant between Christ and the church, his love covers the shame of our nakedness. Letter to the church of Sardis, overcomers get what? White robes. We become new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are remade in the image of God's uh, perfect, uh, created after God's own righteousness and holiness, Ephesians 4. Naked means shame, sin, uncovered. And the covering is the blood of Christ, the blood of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Revelation 1, 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, to him, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed us from our sins and gave us white robes. So when it's talking about nakedness, it's talking about uncovered sin and shame, meaning not in Christ. For what does he do? He doesn't just leave it there. I counsel thee to buy of me, to come to me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open unto me, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. I'm standing at the door knocking to unbelievers, asking them to and giving them the opportunity to invite me in, to believe on me and be saved. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, heavenly treasure, that thou mayest be rich. But the Bema, remember the Bema, 1 Corinthians 3, where it talks about what stands through the fire will be for reward. What doesn't will be for loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Gold tried in the fire, heavenly treasures, faith, works of faith. White raiment. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And to anoint thine eyes with eye sail that thou mayest see. Spirit. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. Believe on me and be saved. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If there is one misconception, I mean, there's many about this letter that I wish to clear up. But I truly do not like hearing the phrase lukewarm Christian. It is wholly inaccurate, uh, W-H-O-L-L-Y. <laughs> There's no such thing. 
The letter to the church of the Laodiceans is written to many people, individuals who have not come to saving knowledge of Christ. It doesn't even seem that they were trying to profess Christ, only that they thought that they were good on their own. And he is showing them that they're not and imploring them to make a different decision, make a decision for him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, offering them a new cover, covenant relationship. And the broader implication of that is in the previous letter, we're going through the door, opening the door to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Entering into that new covenant relationship gets them, behold, I set before thee an open door that no man can shut. Permanent citizenship in the kingdom of God. It is no, uh, it is not ironic. It is no, I can't think of the word I want to use. It should be no surprise that the very next chapter begins with the open door. Because where are you going to go to to see the next? You're going up to the kingdom of God in heaven to see the, the next hereafter, the prophetic begin. Yes, it is the beginning of the next dispensation. Or specifically, it is immediately after the rapture of the church. Um, but the implication of the open door in Laodicea is absolutely not the same implication as the open door in Revelation 4.1. The letter to the Church of Philadelphia open door is absolutely the same thing as the open door in Revelation 4.1. But Laodicea's open door is pre-believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Philadelphia's is post-believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, you're going to the kingdom which is why there's an open door in Revelation 4.1, because you are being taken into the kingdom of God while it is still in heaven. Hence, you seeing God on the throne, first order of business, because thrones hold kings and kings rule kingdoms. Philadelphia, kingdom-based. Laodicea, kingdom-based, but people not yet in the kingdom being implored to get that way. And then Revelation 4.1 shows you in the kingdom, just not the earthly part of it. So if you guys have questions or comments, let me know. I don't think there's anything else for me to go through other than to just start writing about this. However, if you do have further questions, let me know. If I have not said hi to you, hi and chat. Uh, I'll see you guys later.